Sarah. I'm a junior at Geneva High School and I've been going to Chapel Street for like four and a half, five years. I am in National Honor Society, Spanish National Honor Society, DECA, which is like a business club at my school, Alpine Club, which is like a skiing club. I play lacrosse. I do other stuff, I just have to think about it. Student Council. Spanish Club. Axis, and then now D Group, and she served at Adventure Club. I think that's it. She's gone on mission trip to the Twin Cities. Mission twice. Mission trip twice. I wasn't really sure what the love of God really looked like in my life. Going into freshman year, like I didn't really know what it looked like to be a Christian but on the Twin Cities trip was the first time that God felt real to me. When I started coming to like D Group, which is just like this small like circle of people who you were like friends with and it didn't like matter what school you went to, it just like was a place for me to like talk about what it was like to be like a freshman or just like a Christian in high school and that really helped me a lot. What I am most grateful for with Sarah watching her journey is that she really has a lot of friends that are very passionate about their faith and very mature in their faith for their age. Sometimes me and my friends will just like sit down and like have talks about like how God has been working in their life and my life. And I think what's different about me and my church friends and me and my school friends is that like if I have a problem, then the first thing they'll say is like, I'm praying for you. And sometimes we'll just sit down and like have talks and like they'll tell me about how God is working in their life and I'll tell them mine and just how we've like grown in our faith together. One of the most encouraging things to me uh, as I think about the D groups and the high school experience is the fact that on a Sunday night, you'll walk into the fellowship area at Kesslinger and you'll have north of 200 people there, which is bigger than most churches. I know that like there are people in there who like actually care about me. The lesson that I think God was really trying to tell me throughout my freshman year was just like, life is so much harder without him. Since I didn't really know him that well, like it was just hard to like, really find who I was and it was just way easier once I like started my finding myself like in him. Twin Cities 2022 was the week that I got baptized. I'll never forget that. It was like I was calling my mom and I was like asking her like, hey, can I get baptized? And she was like, yeah, go for it. And then when Tom asked me if I wanted, if like I was ready, I was like, I think. And he was like, I don't need an I think, I need an I know. And like in that moment, I was like, I know, I wanna get baptized. And so like when I like went under like and I just opened my eyes as like coming out of the water, I was like, whoa. And like it was just all my friends around me. And it was like, that was probably one of the best nights of my life. I think I just really learned not how to be a Christian, but how to have a relationship with God. And like I really started reading my Bible more. I learned how to like discern what God is like telling me and what I should be like doing and also just like praying to God whenever something is wrong whenever I'm happy whenever I'm sad just like praying in all these like moments and then kind of had to learn this the hard way but like our will is not God's will so we're not obviously going to get everything that we want. As I think about Sarah's faith in God I've seen her mature into someone who's got a real confidence um, in herself and her faith in God and who she is as a person. My favorite part about being in Chapel Street students is just like that community and like they want the best for me and like help me grow in my faith with God and it's really just community that helps the most. We like to say here at Chapel Street that we want everyone to experience grace grow in faith and make an impact right where you are. So we're so grateful for Sarah's story and so many stories like hers and our student ministries and, and our church as a whole. Uh, we want to be a church that serves. We want to serve our kids well. We want to serve our students well. And we want to serve the world as well. So thanks for being part of that. I also want to welcome those of you who are watching online today. So glad you can join us from wherever you are today. And I want to begin by talking just a little bit about water. And I'm going to ask you just a few questions and have you go back to your earth science class days and see if you can answer them. The first question is, what is water? Okay, we say H2O, and I had to actually remind myself what the two was for. Was it for the O's or for the H's? I wasn't that good of a science student. So water is H2O. We know that. Second question, uh, and by the way, did you know that scientists are still studying water? 
still studying why it behaves the way it does. It's one of the most amazing, maybe the most amazing substance in the entire universe, and they're still studying water. Secondly, uh, how much of the Earth's surface is covered with water? A, B, or C? Just holler out what you think. It's B, 70%. Although yesterday it was closer to 90%, I think. <laughs> Three, how much of the Earth's water is drinkable? 20%, 10%, or C? Actually, not very much. 0.3% of the Earth's water is actually drinkable. How much water does the average American use every day? A, B, or C? Holler it out. C, 80 to 100 gallons. I have a son that used about 400 gallons back in the day. Longest showers ever. Uh, average shower takes 10, uh, 25 gallons of water for 10 minutes. Bonus question, how much water does someone living in Africa use every day? Five to 10 gallons. Fifth question, how long can you live without water? Seven days, 14 days, or 40 days? A, seven days, unless you're a camel, but seven days. Life as we know it actually is impossible without water. Scientists have never discovered a single living organism that can survive without water. Maybe that's why the whole Bible starts with water. Genesis begins like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. You may not know that the Bible also ends with water. In Revelation chapter 22, uh, the apostle John is looking into a vision of the new heaven and new earth. And he writes, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the lamb down the middle of the great city. And maybe that's why water shows up very often in the story of Jesus in the gospels. And that's one of the stories we're going to look at here this morning. Our summer-long series is called Face-to-Face, -face, Stories of Meeting Jesus. And the theme of the whole summer was expressed well in the video series, The Chosen. How many of you have been watching The Chosen? By the way, it comes out tonight. You can, you can check it out again on the app this evening, season four. But in an early episode, in an early season, the character who played by Mary Magdalene tries to explain to Nicodemus what's happened to her after meeting Jesus. And here's what she says. She says, I was one way, now I'm completely different, and the thing that happened in between was him. Today we look at a story that comes to us in John's Gospel, John chapter 4. I'm going to read the whole story, and this, by the way, is the longest single conversation Jesus has with anyone in the Gospels. I'll read it all the way through, and then we'll dig in sort of piece by piece. John chapter 4, beginning in verse 4. Now he, Jesus, had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I don't, won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. In fact, the fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you've just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. 
Yet a time is coming and now has come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. We'll finish the last part of that story a bit later this morning. Again, I mentioned that this is the longest single conversation Jesus has with anybody in the Gospels. And it begins with what I'm calling a surprising destination. Surprising destination. Uh, you may be aware through my stories through the years that my wife and I have lived uh, in Batavia now for 35 years. Uh, our boys all grew up and went to Batavia High School. And you might know that when it comes to high school sports, the Batavia Bulldogs and the Geneva Vikings have a longstanding rivalry. About 100 years. Especially in football. In fact, that rivalry is so intense that I once bought a blue car and my boys refused to drive it. In fact, they refused to get in it and ride in it anywhere because it was the wrong color. Uh, but imagine that rivalry getting to the point where I so disliked the people of Geneva, which I don't, and I was so uncomfortable being in the town of Geneva, which I'm not, but Say it was that way, and it was so difficult that I would choose if I had to go from Batavia to St. Charles to drive all the way through West Chicago to get there because I just didn't want to drive through the township of Geneva. Now, if I did that, you would think I had kind of a problem. Well, that's the animosity that lies beneath this story. In verse 4, we read, Now he, Jesus, had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Joseph's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Now this story is chock full of surprises. Some of them are obvious and we can see them, but some of them we can't quite see because we don't live in that time, in that culture. So let me try to pull out some of them for you. The first surprise here is that John tells us that Jesus had to go through Samaria. Now to see the surprise, take a look at this map. This is a map of the ancient region of, Jerusalem, of Israel. You'll see all the way to the south, the Dead Sea, connected by the Jordan River that goes up north toward the Sea of Galilee. And that distance is roughly 65 miles, about the distance from here to Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. So Jesus has been in the southern region there of Judea. He wants to go north to Nazareth, and the most direct route is to, write, is to walk straight through the region called Samaria, which would have been uh, about a two-and-a-half-day walk. And if you count steps, about 160,000 steps. I did the math on that. The problem was that at that time, Many Jews, if not most Jews, would not choose to walk straight through Samaria because there was a centuries-old animosity, hatred, based on uh, ethnic backgrounds and religious differences between the Jews and Samaritans. So they would put the map back up for a second. So they would choose to walk eastward across the Jordan River, north, and then cut back over, and they'd walk twice as far just because they didn't want to go through Samaria. But John says Jesus had to go through Samaria, so we should be asking ourselves, why? That's a little weird. The next surprise, at least to some, is that Jesus is tired. Verse 6, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. The word that's used here in the Greek for tired means to grow weary, to be exhausted, uh, it's the same word Jesus uses in Matthew chapter 11 when he says, Come to me, all you who are weary, same word, and burdened, and I will give you rest. He's been walking all morning. It's now noon, middle of the day, and he's bone tired. We used to call it dog tired. He sits down, and he's thirsty. He stops at Jacob's well. By the, well this, by the way, this well is still there. 
uh, but only you can't see it because it's, they built a Greek Orthodox church right over the top of it. If you've been in that part of the world, that's what happens a lot with these famous sites. Somewhere along the line, they just built a church over it so you can't see it anymore. But the well is there underneath the, the fancy church. Now, we have a tendency, many of us, I think, to think of Jesus as sort of a spiritual, religious superhero, that he really was not like us. But notice here, the one who gives us rest is tired, weary, exhausted. The one who made water is thirsty. And this is the beautiful and to some shocking humanity of Jesus. The very next verse tells us why Jesus chose to walk through Samaria and why he stopped at this well. Verse 7 says, When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? Now, it's not surprising that a woman came to draw water. For most of the world's history, especially uh, in the developing world even today, finding water is a daily ritual of survival. And most often it's the women who go to seek for water around the world in these villages. I've seen it many times myself when I'm traveling around early in the morning, women walking in groups, carrying it back in their heads. In fact, women in Africa walk an average of 3.7 miles a day just to get water for their families. That's why, by the way, uh, you're going to hear in the next couple of weeks, this is a little spoiler alert, that we're partnering with Water for Good uh, for a summer project, Serve the World project. We're partnering with our VBS kids. We're going to raise some money to put some wells in sub-Saharan Africa. But we'll talk about that starting next week. But what is surprising here is the time of day. What time did John say it was? Noon, literally the sixth hour in the way the Jews counted time. Now, the daily chore of gathering water is almost always done early in the morning for two reasons. You need water for all the day's activities, cooking and cleaning and so forth, and because it's cooler in the morning, especially in that part of the world. So it's surprising that this woman is there at noon. The next surprise is that the woman seems to be alone. Gathering water is typically a communal experience around the world. Uh, it's a social affair. Women walk together for both safety and for companionship, but not this woman. And Jesus would have surely immediately noticed something is wrong with this picture. She's here at the wrong time, and she's alone. And we should be asking ourselves, why? But the greatest surprise in this part of the story is that Jesus speaks to this woman. He says, will you give me a drink? First of all, because Jesus was a Jewish man, it would have been highly socially inappropriate for a Jewish man to address a woman who was not his wife in a public place. And especially for a Jewish man to address a Samaritan woman. Now, side note here, as we read through the Gospels, we'll see some other stories this summer, uh, Jesus is absolutely revolutionary in how he treats and regards women over against the culture of his time. In that culture and time, women were regarded, for example, as being unworthy of instruction in theology, spiritual things, or the scripture, the Jewish law. There was a rabbinical saying at the time saying, it is better to burn the law than give it to a woman. But Jesus didn't see women that way. He taught women. He allowed women to serve him and to follow him. Uh, women were at the foot of the cross when he died. Women were at the empty tomb when he rose from the dead. So that secondly here, notice that Jesus not only speaks to this woman, he asks her for a drink. Now at this point, an ancient Jewish audience, uh, either hearing this story or reading it, would have gasped or maybe groaned. It would have been unthinkable disturbing, even disgusting for them. A Jewish man would never, not in a million years, not even if he was dying of thirst, drink water from the same bucket a Samaritan woman was using to draw water. Because Samaritan women to the Jews were seen as being perpetually unclean, religiously speaking. So this would have been the equivalent of today, getting down on your hands and knees, and slurping water out of your dog's bowl. That's what it would have felt like to a Jewish audience. John tells us even the woman is surprised. Verse 9 says, The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? So Jesus is not supposed to go through Samaria, but he does. 
He's not supposed to speak to a woman, but he does. He's especially not supposed to speak to a Samaritan woman, but he does. And he's really not supposed to drink from her bucket. He's supposed to see her as ritually unclean, but he does. Jesus blows right through all these social, cultural, and religious barriers, and we should be asking why. Because he doesn't see a Samaritan woman. He doesn't see a woman unworthy of his presence or his attention. He sees a person created in the image of God, a lonely woman dying of thirst, not physical thirst, but emotional and spiritual thirst, a woman thirsty for that which only he can give. And that leads us, secondly, to a surprising conversation. Surprising conversation. Uh, a couple of months ago, I was uh, just finishing up a workout at the fitness center I go to often, and I went to the steam room. That's one of my favorite things to do after a workout. It was really steamy uh, and hard to see anything in there, so I walked in. I immediately became aware that there was one other guy in the steam room, but I couldn't see very clearly because it's steamy. Uh, so I just sat down over here, and he was over there. And he surprised me about a minute after I sat down by initiating a conversation. It, it, it was surprising, and it was a little weird because that's kind of not what you do in a steam room. And so I was surprised. Um, and I could tell by his accent that he wasn't from here. Uh, so I asked him then to respond to the conversation, where is he from? And he said, Uganda. And I said, ah, I've been to Uganda. He said, you've been to Uganda, my country? I said, I've been to Uganda. And I said, what city are you from in Uganda? He said, I'm from Mbale. I said, I've been to Mbale. I went there to visit a cure hospital in 2019, and he was really surprised. So we had this conversation in the steam room. And again, a little weird, but we had this long conversation. Then I asked him, since he'd only been here for a short while, what have you noticed most about American life? being here in the country. And I thought he was going to say something like, you know, the affluence, uh, the size of the homes, the cars, the condition of the roads. But what he said surprised me. He said, what I've noticed most is the availability of water in your country. He said, you have water everywhere. Verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Now, that phrase living water meant water in motion at that time, running water, which was regarded as cleaner than stagnant water. And by the way, a little later in John's gospel, Jesus uses the, the phrasing of living water to point to the promised coming of the Holy Spirit. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his livestock? Notice Jesus said here, if you knew, and then he mentions two things, if you knew the gift of God, and the word he uses for gift there is a word that means a gift freely given, a gift that has no need of repayment, the same word the book of Acts uses to point to the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, if you knew who it is who asks you for a drink, in other words, if you knew who I am, if you knew me, you would know I am greater than your father Jacob because I give a greater kind of water. Verse 13, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water gesturing to the well, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So what's he saying here? I think he's saying that everyone is thirsty. Every human being thirsts for physical water, H2O. We need it to live. We can only live a certain number of days without it. I remember... Um, playing high school football and having summer three-a-day practices. And in those days, coaches weren't required to give you water breaks. Uh, they, they often would use water as a punishment. Uh, you guys get no water today. You're not playing well. And so we'd go to whole practices without water, summertime. I remember telling myself, whenever I get the chance to drink again, I'm going to drink as much water as I, until, I, until I just burst. I, I'm going to drink until I can't stand up. And sometimes we would run into the, sh into the showers with our uniforms still on and just gulp water from the shower faucets because we were so thirsty. 
But Jesus here is talking about, about a different kind of thirst, not H2, H2O thirst, but a spiritual thirst. Every human being longs thirst to be known, to be seen, to be valued, to be loved. We thirst for a way to deal with the pain and the failures of our past. We thirst for forgiveness of some kind. We thirst for hope in the future. And just as with physical thirst, we will drink from almost any well, almost any source to try to satisfy that deep inner thirst. And the world, I think, is full of people drinking from wells that do not ultimately satisfy the deepest longings of our souls. Wells marked work or money or relationships. And maybe you remember a generation ago, rock star Mick Jagger sang, I can't get no satisfaction. That's true. Maybe you were once that way in your life. Maybe you feel a little bit like that today. Jesus has something that our souls need more than our bodies need water. The living water of Jesus that brings cleansing and new life, new hope. And that leads us to the third part of the story, and it ends with this, a surprising declaration. Verse 15, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. At first, she sort of misunderstands. She's thinking he's talking literally, He's offering her a way to avoid having to come and get water every day. But he's not talking about H2O. He's talking about himself. And so he presses in closer. Verse 16, he told her, go, call your husband, and come back. In other words, go get your husband. We'll talk about all this together. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. In fact, is you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you've just said is quite true. So suddenly the conversation gets personal, very personal. So what's going on in this woman's life? Some scholars and commentators have said that this indicates that she has lived and is living an immoral life, a life of shame, a life of serial intimate relationships, and that this is why she's by herself at the well in the middle of the day, that she's an outcast from her own community. She's shunned. No one wants to be around her. Others, however, have said, not so fast. That may not necessarily be true. Maybe she's just lived a painful life. Maybe she's lost five husbands to death. Or maybe they've divorced her. She's been discarded. And now she's living with a man just trying to survive. But whatever it is, we see here that Jesus touches the most personal and painful part of her life. Because this is what living water does. Verse 19, sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is Jerusalem. Now, notice two things here. First, she changes the subject from the personal stuff to a theological question. What about that? Let's not talk about me. Let's talk about that. But second, she's also confused. She's confused about God and about what God thinks of her Verse 21, woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming. And literally there, the Greek is, the hour is coming. And in John's gospel, whenever Jesus talks about the hour that's coming, he's talking about his death. He's talking about the cross. When you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and truth. In other words, it's not about a place. It's not about a temple. It's not about a location. A new thing is happening. And that new thing that's happening is me. By the way, this is why we can worship together here instead of having to go to Jerusalem and worship. Verse 25, the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Boom! Sorry to startle you. <laughs> Did you see that? Literally, the Greek here is ego a me. I am, I am the one speaking to you. 
There it is. She's confused about God. She knows she's far from him. She has a vague idea of the coming of Messiah. Maybe he will explain things. Maybe he will tell her what God thinks of her. Maybe he can explain her painful life. Maybe he will someday somehow bring something good. And Jesus chooses this moment, this conversation with this woman to reveal his full identity. I am he. The one you're waiting for is here. I've come all this way. I've walked all morning for this conversation with you here at this well because you matter to me. I know who you are. I know your past. I know why you're here at noon. I know why you're here alone. But I came here to meet you. I came here to offer you a gift. Verse 27, just then his disciples returned and were surprised. The word is actually stronger than that. It's astonished to find him talking with a woman. But no one asks, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? I think, this is just my guess. I think the disciples were so shocked that they were embarrassed for him. He shouldn't be doing this. Why is he talking to her? This is weird. This makes us really uncomfortable. Did he drink from her bucket? Because he's breaking all the rules that they'd grown up with. Verse 28, then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. And here's the last surprise of the story. This lonely, perhaps outcast, perhaps discarded woman, becomes the first witness to Jesus the Messiah. Jumping ahead to verse 39, we read, Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of this woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. We've now heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. In each of the stories we look at this summer, uh, we're gonna urge you to try to find yourself in the story. That's why I think we have them in the Gospels, to find ourselves in the story. And there are three ways into the story, I think. First, there is the woman who is unclean, unloved, unworthy, without hope, dying from emotional and spiritual thirst. And maybe in some way, that describes how you feel right here this morning. Then there are the disciples who are following Jesus, but they still see labels like Samaritan, like woman, like unclean. They're seeing categories instead of people. Maybe you can see yourself in them just a little bit. And then there's Jesus, who sees not a label, but a person, who offered not judgment, but love and grace, who offered not the dry dust of religion and religious rules, but the living, bubbling, sparkling water of a transforming relationship with the living God. Years ago, uh, our family was invited uh, by a church friend to uh, go visit their cottage in Wisconsin on a lake and they had a boat and stuff. And before we went, though, our friend told us uh, to make sure while we were there to go by the well and get some water out of the well because it was the best water in the whole world. The best water we'd ever tasted was at that well. He drew a hand-drawn map to show us how to get there. So we stayed up there. We enjoyed the time there. And the last day of the trip, we decided we needed to go find this well because we knew he was going to ask us about it when we got back. So we took out the map, drove along this country road, outside Whitewater, Wisconsin, to find the farm where the well was supposed to be located. And sure enough, we found it, just on the side of the road. A single pipe sticking out of some rocks, water pouring out of the pipe onto the ground. So we filled a gallon jug, we all tasted it, and he was right. Crystal clear, ice cold, best water I'd ever tasted. And then I noticed a little sign next to the well. It said this, a local farmer dug this well in 1895. He hit an artesian spring, and the well has pumped 40 gallons a minute, 60,000 gallons a day, every day since, for over 100 years. Which meant for my entire lifetime, for my parents' entire lifetime, for my grandparents' entire lifetime, 
That well has been pumping out 40 gallons a minute out of the ground. Best water I've ever tasted. Finest, purest water I've ever tasted. All I had to do was catch it, receive it, and then share it. And standing there on the side of the road, it dawned on me, that's what Jesus was talking about in this story. Whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. That's the story of the woman at the well. You bow with me as I close. Thank you for your word, Lord, for this beautiful and surprising story of a nameless woman who one day long ago discovered the living water of your grace. And as we come to the bread and cup of communion, may we drink deeply again from the only water that quenches our deepest thirst. And may we see people around us, not through the lens of race or religion or sex or politics, but through the gospel that transforms. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hopefully you were handed a small uh, cup when you walked into the worship center today. This table of communion doesn't belong to us as a church. It belongs to the Lord. So even if you're visiting with us for the first time, uh, you're encouraged to share with us the bread and cup if you've put your faith in the Lord Jesus. You'll notice on the bottom side of the cup is a smaller opening. Just peel that back. You'll find the bread in there. The New Testament tells us on the night before he died, Jesus met with his disciples around a meal. And partway through that meal, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of him. Now you can turn it over, carefully peel off the top side with the juice. Scripture tells us that after the bread, Jesus also poured a cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sin. The Apostle Paul reminds us that as followers of Jesus, each time we drink this cup, we proclaim his death until he comes again. Let's do this in remembrance of him. Just before the benediction, uh, I want to remind you earlier this morning, I said that we want to serve our students and serve our kids well. Two things you can do this morning to do that. As you head out, pick up your prayer card for student mission trips. They'll be handing them out there. Take it with you. Take it home. Remind yourself to pray for, pray over our kids as they serve the summer. But secondly, for a couple of weeks now, we've been talking about serving our children well through VBS and Sunday school this summer. It's a big challenge. Thank you to so many who've stepped up, and we're getting really close. We need 30 more people to serve in VBS and just 20 more people to give one hour once a month this summer as helpers in our Sunday school. That's just three hours all summer. I think we can fill those needs this morning because there's enough people here in this room who can do that. So to step up to that challenge, just take a, uh, scan the code in the back of the chair in front of you. It'll take you right to where you need to go or go out to the children's ministry area. Make yourself available to serve our kids. Thank you for, in advance for that. Receive now the benediction. May we go now in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the living water, who satisfies the deepest thirst of our souls. Amen. Have a great day.